I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by today's guest, Carrie Preston, to talk all about her TV show, Claws. And when you first took on this role, oh my gosh, I love it. <laughs> Even when you're not in production. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> when you first jumped into this role and we're, we're looking at the scripts, you know, you always speak to how it was the scripts that were the biggest draw to you. And in particular, all the different tones and voices of the show and the way that it flowed so seamlessly between them. And one of the things that I love in watching this show is that every season finds even more new spaces and even more new tones to explore. And so from an actor's standpoint, through your performance, how do you feel like each season has really just given you so many opportunities to just expand and evolve on your skill set in balancing between all these different tones within each episode? Well, I mean, the tone was set from the get-go, so we were lucky in that way. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard the phrase jumping the shark. <laughs> it's a phrase that's used to sort of indicate that a show has kind of maybe gone over a certain line and gone into a kind of a, a, a crazy realm. Um, well, we did that, I would say, from the very beginning. So once you've done that and you've set up that, you know, anything can happen, no holds barred, then uh, it gave us the creative freedom to really lean into that and uh, embrace it and widen it as well as deepen it all throughout the, the four seasons. Um, but I found that with my character, because, you know, she's this con artist who, uh, you know, she steals people's credit cards, but she also steals their identities. Um, it was really fun because I, uh, I never really knew who the real Polly was, you know, my character's name is Polly. And I never really, you know, knew who the real one was because she was, she was like peeling an onion, you know? And uh, so for me, it was kind of a, a mystery of, you know, getting to the, the core of the, of the Tootsie pop, you know, <laughs> like how many, how many times do, do we have to, you know, lick till we get to the center. And what we did was, um, we just kept uh, putting her in, you know, vulnerable situations and the more vulnerable she would get, then the more kind of defensive she would get. And then the more characters that she would put up as a defense. And that as an actor was, you know, once in a lifetime kind of stuff. Yeah. And you also had the opportunity to play that journey of, of when we discovered a lot of her backstory, when we learned about her twin sister who had died when they were kids, which was really the precipice of so much of what you were just describing for her as a character. How much of that did you know about at the beginning? I know that they told you, you know, oh, there's the backstory that she has in real life is, is much more in depth than even the things that she's saying out loud to other people. And I was interested in the moment that you kind of knew those details to be able to play to it, but also the moments in which you didn't know where that was, where the journey was heading. And then how, once you had those details, you had to make sure that you were building towards that trajectory and that reveal. Right. Well, they don't really, um, you know, give you all of the details at the beginning. So you're kind of finding things out as you're getting the scripts. So um, I knew in that season where I was going to be uh, playing my own twin. I knew that was coming, but I didn't know how it was going to develop. I didn't know that it was, you know, essentially something that was in Polly's mind, you know, um, but nonetheless to her, it's very real, you know? And so when, when you're an actor, um, you really can only play what you have and what you know is at hand. So um, something might change in the next episode, but you're playing the truth of whatever it is that you know at that moment, the way we do in real life, right? We don't know what the next moment is going to bring. So, um, you know, we're just coming at our own lives, you know, based on our, our own histories and what we know up until that point. And so um, that was kind of the case with, with this show. Um, that said, you know, they would give us sort of a a general, you know, kind of sketch of like where it was going to go. And um, so we could, you know, sort of build it out. But basically, it was kind of episode by episode, really. 
Yeah. And you also had that really brilliant moment when you were playing both Polly and her twin sister, where you got to recreate, you know, what would have been their skating routine, dance routine yeah. to True Colors. Um, but what I loved about that is that that was actually your suggestion to the show, A, that that scene exists in the first place. And secondly, that it was also that was the song that they would have danced to. Um, and so have you found that overall in working on this show that this has been a space that allows you a lot of creative autonomy in terms of your character and the way that you're ad able to advocate for certain moments? And, and if there have been other moments following that that you've really been able to push for narratively for her within the show? Well, first of all, thanks for um, doing all of your research. Um, I'm very, very glad to, to see that you um, enjoy the show and that you know so much about it. Um, yes, it was uh, such a wonderful and challenging and bizarre thing to uh, do the, the twin thing. Luckily uh, for me, I asked them, could I please have uh, an actor to play the scenes with? So they hired somebody who, you know, is a professional actor and she would, you know, put the wigs on and the, and the clothes and they would shoot over her. But I felt like I was actually acting with someone and not just myself, but she would kind of mirror back to me what I was doing for each of the characters. And, um, they said, you know, uh, we're, we're going to, they wanted to do like an ice skating thing, but you know, <laughs> it's new Orleans where we shoot. That's not easy to pull off. So they said, okay, well, we're, we'll do this dance. And, um, just by the way, the nature of how things work in television, um, the other actor and I didn't get to work with the choreographer until the night before. So we were having to put the piece together with the choreographer the night before and then learn you had to learn mirror dances so imagine if you have to learn this you have to learn your part is and then you have to learn the man's part imagine like that that's what we had to do and then sometimes you were dancing one part sometimes you were dancing another and they would be you know compot what they call compositing to do the green screen to to make make the magic later in post um but i love that kind of thing you know, I get excited when I'm up against a challenge, when it's like game day and we have so much to do and, you know, all of my, my training and all of, all of the things that I love about acting just come into play on, on days like that. And luckily um, to your question, we had incredible um, showrunner and uh, the creator of the show. Um, they were so, um, permissive and they were so um, encouraging and, you know, they were never prescriptive about what we needed to do. And that is not always the case. You know, a lot of times there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen and yes, you know, it's, it is a, a cable TV show and there are studios and networks and stuff like that, but they really let us kind of let our creative flags fly really. And, um, for me, that was such a gift and um, something that was kind of rare. And that's why I treasured it so much. I also, within your initial development of Polly as a character, wanted to talk about finding finding her voice in a very literal sense and, and that journey of really figuring out where on the register does her voice land? You know, what's, what's the delivery of dialogue for her? Because I know that that was something that you thought very consciously about for her. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, when I went about, um, you know, really building the character before I even went to the first table read, a lot of times what I do is um, I'll go on Facebook and I'll just like stalk real people <laughs> who live in the places where these characters live. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't put their privacies up. And so it's just a great way to kind of get into the the environment to get into the world uh in which these characters live and then i started looking into and in specific you know people who had been incarcerated and i started looking at shows about women's prisons and you know and i found a couple of women who i found really fascinating because they were um tough but they had these really high voices and I thought, what is that about? You know, I really think that's a fascinating um, dichotomy. And it spoke to me because it feels like, it felt like always to me that Polly is curating her own life. So of course she's going to curate her own voice. So it's going to feel a little disconnected. 
It's going to feel like something that is laid on top of something else underneath. And so not really realizing it, I had also given myself um, a real uh, advantage because I was then able to take that higher register and begin to lower it as I was creating all the personas that she would become. So I, I was able, I didn't even know it was happening at first, but I, because I, I wasn't even aware that I was going to be playing so many different personas throughout the four years, but it gave me a lot of range um, in which to play and always kind of recentering myself back in that kind of higher pitched uh, painted on, if you will, uh, voice. That's so fascinating. And and going off of the, the way that you were just describing kind of the toughness against the high pitched voice, it always feels like in the way that you play her, that you capture the side of her that has that softness, that's very empathetic to people around her. And yet, you know, she's also a character you would not mess with in any way, shape or form at the same time. Um, and are you always conscious about making sure that you're really servicing both of those sides of her because both of them are such truth for her? Yes, yes, I love that part. And I always wanted to find places where I could sneak in just the idea that, you know, Polly did just fine in prison. Um, she probably did a little damage to some people while she was there because they were not going to expect that, you know, she was probably going to fashion a, a shank out of, you know, a bed spring or something and use it if need be. Um, and I think she also uh, likes to keep people on their toes, you know. Um, I also played with a lot of the idea, and the writers, you know, gave me this a, a lot as well, that, you know, she's fascinated by make-believe, you know, she's fascinated by um, romance novels. And, you know, uh, I, I brought in this, this idea that, you know, she, she would become fascinated maybe with um, public figures that maybe fell from grace or that were a little controversial or, you know, that, um, that, that got in the public eye by being, you know, a, a, a little bit uh, contradictory, you know? Um, so I would just for my own self, just to give myself some specificity, I would, you know, make little decisions like she watches judge Judy all the time, or she's obsessed with Kathleen Turner. And, you know, she kind of, got obsessed with uh, Martha Graham because she was such a grand dancer, you know, so I would uh, just play around with those kinds of things just as an actor, just so I could keep keep things fresh for myself and also keep things really specific. There's also a lot of fun in just kind of all the one liners that she throws in where she's just saying like, oh, I was in a girl band in the 90s, but I had to quit and I had to leave for these reasons. Yes. But at the same time, there's also moments where she's throwing in these asides and these untruths, but there's a truth underneath it. Yeah, you regard. never really know. Yeah, you yeah. never really like you, 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 you know, you're, you're supposed to go, oh, wow, she's such a liar. But yet you know, maybe she did hang out with, you know, Patty Hearst or something. Maybe she did, you know, maybe she did go to some Ronald Reagan, you know, inauguration or something like it, it just to keep the audience guessing and the people around her guessing, because the more she believes it, you know, the more she's going to be able to get away with whatever it is that she wants to get away with. You know, she's very convincing. Um, even when she's lying and, you know, you look at con artists and that's how they get people to do what they want to want them to do. You know, they believe fully in what it is they're selling. Yeah. How is it helpful at all for you to determine kind of whether there is any truthfulness in what she's saying, or is it more just about finding the emotional truth for her and in, in what she's connecting to in the story that she's telling? Well, I think, uh, for, for, uh, me, um, I played it all that Polly just believes hundred percent what it is that she's saying. You know, I mean, she is a little delusional, but I'm not going to put that kind of judgment on her as an actor. She doesn't think she's being delusional at all, you know, which is where the comedy comes in, you know, because the more kind of matter of fact she is about things, um, the funnier. And also just the more, um, you know, she can manipulate that. She's also a character that in a lot of ways is very reactionary to the external circumstances around her. And that's, you know, whether it's a story that she wants to tell to create a certain motion or environment or tone within a conversation, 
or if it's just, you know, because of her struggles with mental health, that there's certain things that, that are triggering for her. And sometimes they are larger things. And sometimes it's just a very small detail that could be an inflection for her that nobody else would even realize. And so when you get new scripts for the show and you're going through, how do you kind of mine for those details and the way that the external forces, whether they're large or small details are really going to influence and impact how you're playing her in particular scenes? Yeah, it, um, I mean, it goes really scene by scene. I, I, you know, uh, and I do this with all, all of my work, if, if I can, where, you know, I'll, I'll come through the script. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll kind of clock what the obvious choices are and then I'll think, okay, what, what's the next choice down? Well, okay. And, and then how do we go deeper? And then how do we make that more specific? And where, you know, if something is, I know it's supposed to be a joke or something, if I know, okay, this is, this is in there because we're going for a laugh. Um, how can I make it true and grounded? You know, um, and so I would do the same thing for her, her emotional journey as well. And also, you know, I got to say the writing was top notch and the actors that I was playing with are top notch, you know, and our crew and everything. So, you know, we're all entering into those scenes as a real ensemble. And there's, uh, there was such a collaborative spirit, so much so that unlike some of the other shows that I've been on uh, we would, we would talk and say, hey, why don't, let's try that. What if you tried that? You know, and generally it's kind of a no, no that you don't, you don't really give other actors direction. It's, it's sort of known as, you know, it's a, it can be disrespectful because it puts people on the defensive and makes people feel like, oh gosh, I'm not making the right choices or that kind of thing. Well, we didn't have that. You know, we kind of got rid of that because we were all had this common goal, which was to really make these scenes fly and we would discuss them, you know, as a group and, you know, we had great directors. And so all of those decisions then, and and all of that collaboration would go into, you know, making a moment. And, you know, I always like to give directors and editors a lot of um, leeway in in the uh, editing room, you know, in case, because I'm a director as well. Um, in case you get in the editing room and they think, oh gosh, we, we need a moment of, of gravity here, or we need a moment of levity here. And we can piece that together from what we've gotten from these actors. And I feel like our, our group was able to really help with that. Yeah. And you mentioned you're directing there and you've directed both in the independent space, but also on Claws and also on The Good Fight, a couple of episodes mm-hmm. there as well. Um, and especially given the fact that with both of the TV shows that you've directed on recently were worlds that you already knew so well. What mm-hmm. was your kind of journey of really looking at the visual language of the show, the world that you knew so well and really figuring out what your style was in terms of how you wanted to come into the show and direct those episodes for both of them? Um, well, uh, like you said, I, I, I knew the worlds, which was so helpful um, f- from being in front of the camera, but being behind the camera is a whole, you know, another, it's a whole nother beast. And so um I did some shadowing, what we call shadowing, where you follow other directors around and see the, you know, the process soup to nuts, you know, Um, because if you don't know how the sausage is made, it's not going to taste very good, you know, when you get to the, you know, kitchen. So um, I had been doing shadowing all along uh, in other shows that I'd been on and just, um, you know, figuring out uh, how each show runs because they're all different, you know. Um, so for, for Claws, uh, I followed around, um, Jamie Travis, who's a wonderful director and, um, and he was great. And it, interestingly enough, he, he and I both directed features that were at Sundance at the same time, although we didn't really meet then, but, um, I just thought I really liked his style. I liked what he did with our show. I found that when I watched the episodes that he directed, there was something that I thought was really cool and I wanted to learn from him. So I I did, you know, learn from him, but being in front of the camera, you can steal from a lot of different directors, you know, because you work with director after director and you can either take things or leave things behind, depending on, you know, what the director uh, gives you. And um, so I had, you know, the benefit of that. 
Um, and then, you know, getting into prep, like you have an incredible team around you, you know, you have, you have the first AD who's really keeping you on schedule and you have, you know, your production designer, your costume designer, you have all these incredible people who have, you know, they've been in the trenches. And so you end up leaning on them. Um, but I really found that my, uh, my work as an independent director really, um, helped because, uh, when you do things independently, you have to be super creative with very limited resources. And then in TV, you have way more resources, but if you come at it with that mentality, then you can be a little more economical about how you're using your time. And, um, I also find, you know, since I'm still, uh, have done less directing than acting, I find that, you know, the, the trick is to be profoundly prepared, like over prepared, because when you get on set, um, all of the work that you've done invariably is going to kind of fall apart just because of time. That's just the nature of it. You're up against the clock at all times and, um, things fall apart. But if you've got a plan, then at least you're starting off with, um, you know, a, a, a nice foundation that you can build your day on. Yeah. And between independent cinema and budgeted television, you know, there's the obvious differences that you were just mentioning. But when you're working in independent cinema, because you've got such limited resources and schedules tend to be incredibly short, you have to be very economical and quick with the creative problem solving and mm -hmm. the way that you're making decisions. And so did you find that also there were actually aspects of, of that that really carried over into television because television has higher budgets and more resources available, but still moves at that breakneck speed and that really fast pace. Yes, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> this feature that I directed, um, that I was just mentioning that was at Sundance, we shot it on film, um, which, you know, most people shoot on digital, but we, we shot it on super 16 in New York city, running all around the city and different locations. And, you know, so when you have that, um, breakneck speed, you, you really learn how to make decisions very, very quickly. And that's, that's really a lot of what has to happen as a director. You have people coming at you all day long. What about what, what do you need here? What do you want there? What's next? What's next? What are we going to do? How do you want, how do you solve this, this, and this? And, um, you know, if you've done your work and you've prepared, um, over prepared and you have a great team around you, uh, generally you're going to be able to, you know, create something. Um, and yes, there are challenges, but you kind of don't let them get to you as much because, you know, you've already been shot out of a cannon with, the, with the indie world. And so, um, there's a calm that you can have, uh, because just because just by doing it over and over again, that said, um, you know, there's uh, a level of anxiety with directing that's, that's, way higher than, um, than acting I found. And, and that's simply because I've just done more acting, you know? Um, and so I, you know, I hope to continue to, you know, do more and more and more directing so I can have, uh, you know, just a little <laughs> less anxiety <laughs> the next time around. And jumping back to, to working on Claws and what you were saying before about the dynamic with the cast, I also wanted to specifically ask about your work with Niecy Nash, because the relationship between Desna and Polly, you know, is something that is of such importance to Polly as a character and really brings out so many facets in her. And I feel like every single season, the two of you have really managed to elevate um, and find new layers in terms of what that relationship is and was just interested in the way that you're just, you're never kind of settling for like, well, this is what their relationship dynamic is. It's always still about finding those new spaces that you can take it. Yes. Yes. I mean, Polly is extremely loyal to Desna, you know, Desna saved her life. That's it, you know, and that will never, ever change, you know? And so for Polly, she's always going to do whatever she can to pay that back, you know, and the writers gave us such a great arc and a great journey and it will continue into season four. Um, and, you know, Nisi is just fantastic. I mean, she's a powerhouse, you know, and so um, we really all, you know, uh, congregated around her. We all just became 
fingers on a hand, you know, um, where we were all just working as, as one, you know, instead of individually. And so, um, you know, it was, uh, it was an incredible journey. I mean, there's a whole core group of us that text every day, you know, we're, we're still extremely close. Um, especially since we had a lot of challenges during COVID, um, because we shot the first five episodes of season four before the pandemic. And then this, the last five after, and, you know, those last five, I mean, a whole, a, a core group of us, uh, we all lived on the same floor. It was like, we all went to college together so we could pod together and, you know, so that we could really like support each other and, and be there for each other during this, you know, uncertain time. Yeah. And didn't you have a kind of like a speech and kind of like a thanks that you wanted to give the crew when you were shooting your final scene that you weren't able to because there was a COVID exposure within your pocket so somebody else had to give it? And what what were the things that were the most important for you to express to the people that you've been working with for all these seasons on this show and wrapping out on it? Well, our, you know, we shot in New Orleans, like I said, and, uh, you know, probably my favorite city in the U S just, you know, besides New York where I live, um, just the community of people there, the crew, the, the talent of the crew, the loyalty that they have with each other, with the city. Um, and you know, they're there, they're the first people there. They're the last people to leave. The hours are insane. And they, um, had also this, um, you know, New Orleans is so, um, there's such camaraderie there and there's such, there's such a sense of, of festival and carnival. And I mean that in the, the bigger picture, you know, and so they would bring that to set, you know, and they sacrificed a lot in their own personal lives, you know, to do that. And so, um, I really wanted to, you know, acknowledge them on this last day of shooting, um, when I was uh, in the la- very last scene of the whole series and um, some of the actors had already had to go home because of COVID. And so I wanted to, you know, take a little lit- leadership role and and speak on behalf of the cast. And um, and then I was heading out to go to work and, and the COVID officer called and said, uh, you know, there was a positive case and we've contact traced. And so you're, you're done. That's it. That's the series wrap on you. You can't come in. And I just started bawling. I mean, I just cried so hard because I really wanted that closure. I really wanted that last moment. I wanted to be in the last scene of the series. You know, I'd been there since the very beginning. Um, So it was like this heartbreak, you know, but then I thought, all right, well, what do we do? Well, there were a couple of other actors there and Judy Reyes being one. And I just sent her the speech and I said, look, put me on FaceTime whenever you guys rap. And if you wouldn't mind just reading the speech that I wrote and, you know, tell everybody it's for me. And so that she helped me out on the phone and read the speech and I could see everybody and, um, you know, they could see me and uh, one of the other actors had to, had to do that as well. And so, you know, we were all just kind of, still able to be together, you know, the way you and I are right now in these crazy times. And it was, you know what, it was enough. It was enough. I really love hearing that. And, you know, congratulations on everything that you've done with your performance and this character throughout the four seasons on this show. And thank you so much, Carrie. Thank you. It was really fun to talk to you about this.